Hi, everyone. Welcome to Mastrius. Come on in, grab a seat, make yourselves at home. My name is Julie DeBoer, and it's a pleasure to welcome you. It's always so great to see our Mastrius members here. Hi, guys. Thanks for using your free ticket to be here. And if you're checking us out for the first time, welcome. Uh, we're really glad to have you. Mastrius is a very supportive, interactive community, so please feel free to say hello in the chat. Share your comments, uh, even your stories and your questions. And throughout the, this chat, we will try to get to them all. If you're curious about our goals focused on competitive community, check out masteries.com. We'd love for you to get connected in this creative community. If you have questions, I'm actually going to stay on here after the event to share more about the community and how we help artists work with master artists and professional artists for mentorship, teaching, and support. Uh, with artists like Amy, uh, Shannon, Amy, <laughs> sorry, I always want to call her Amy. Um, and I'm going to actually give away a one month events membership during the post event chat. So stick around if you're not a member. Today, I'm really looking forward to talking with Shannon, Amy, who is one of our new master artists at Masterius. These lunch hour chats are always an adventure as we delve into the deep together. My hope is that you'll find encouragement in Amy's story and that it gives you courage and inspiration in your own journey as an artist. Welcome, Shannon. She is an award-winning full-time artist who explores senses and memory through her gorgeous and vibrant abstract work with acrylics and pastels. Shannon has spent time all over the world, living in Asia for many years, uh, from Bhutan to Korea, on both Canadian coasts in Central and South America, and she's currently exploring a Nordic culture living in Finland. She loves making art every day and mentoring other artists on their own creative journeys. As an art teacher, she found her passion for working with aspiring artists. Shannon has degrees in visual fine arts, interdisciplinary leadership, art education, even a master's in creativity, love, and spirituality. That's so cool. She says that transitioning to a full-time artist has been the most exciting, scary, and fulfilling experience of her creative career, and I'm so excited to chat with her about that. Uh, welcome, Shannon. How are you? Ah, great, Julie. Thanks for having me here. Wow, what an introduction. <laughs> <laughs> yep, it's uh, it's interesting to hear that spoken about yourself, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I'm, again, I'm Julie DeBoer, folks. Uh, I'm a professional artist and I'm joining you from uh, near Calgary, Alberta in Western Canada. My medium is acrylic and my work, as you can see, is bold and whimsical and moving towards abstract and impressionism. I'm one of the founders of Masterius too, and I'm also a member receiving mentorship and I'm also a mentor working with aspiring artists. I love this community at Masterius, and I'm so thrilled to build it and be part of it. And again, I'll stay on here after the event is done um, to chat more about how you can join the supportive community, how to work directly with one of our master artists like Amy, um, whose mentorship group starts in a few weeks, I believe. And okay. I'll give away a one month events membership after the event. Um, all right, so let's dive in, Shannon. How are you, first of all? Yeah, I'm great. Thank you. It's a beautiful sunny day and nothing to complain about, right? All That's right. Good. Where, <laughs> where are you right now? You're not in Finland. No, right now I am on Vancouver Island. Um, so we're here for seven weeks actually visiting oh. family. So when you make the journey over, we try and come for a good chunk of time. And so... Yeah, it's just really nice to be in Canada right now and be home visiting everybody. Awesome. All right. Well, tell us a little bit about yourself, um, your life, uh, your art. Yeah, just dive in a little bit and then we'll start asking you some okay. questions. Um, yeah. Okay. Where do we start? So I think I will just like take it back. Um, <laughs> probably a lot of people uh, who are here with us right now and part of this community can identify with this but I was always an, an art kid growing growing up uh, I always gravitated to you know the colors and the cutting and the collaging and the painting and 
my parents have uh, copies of my Christmas list to Santa when I was very young. And, you know, I'm always asking for scissors and rulers and these kinds of things. <laughs> That's cute. <laughs> and then my photos from school in kindergarten and such are always ones with me with a smock at the painting station. And um, yeah, so that's sort of what I was always interested in as my, you know, expression, as my outlet, as my desire to, to create. So it's kind of been with me quite long. And uh, in high school, you know, when you're trying to pick where to go to university and what you're gonna do after and all of those kinds of things, um, I was really torn between like outdoor education leadership and, and visual fine arts. Mm -hmm. And I think I loved both, but I really was unsure what does that path look like to study visual fine arts. And I think that's just the way that we're socialized and brought up and in the school system. Like it's not presented to us right. that becoming a full-time artist or going to art school is actually a real job or career or possibility. And we get all these other things that were sort of job crowded and career crowded yeah. into looking into and I can remember when I was about 17 interviewing all my family and friends and being like am I more outdoorsy or am I more arty <laughs> <laughs> you're pretty outdoorsy but I think like art's your thing mm. um so in the end I did end up going to art school first at, in Toronto at the Ontario Culture Art and Design Ooh. and um yeah and then that just went on to many, many years of hanging around in academia and education and, and learning. But um, Julie, feel free to interrupt me anytime. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just going to let you run with it. <laughs> but, you know, when I, the entire time I was in art school, I think art school, it was such, a, such an interesting place. But it really was a time of... Um, feeling like for the first time ever I was really surrounded by my 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 people that I <laughs> I didn't know all these other people like me existed when I was in high school and now I was just every day in rooms and studios with other people who just had this vibration inside of them and this need to create right and not necessarily to have a final product or not necessarily to you know have something to sell to earn a living we were 18 and in school it was just people who needed their output of themselves yeah. to be something made with their hands, something created with their hands and something visual. And um, that was a pretty cool experience, you know, to be surrounded by so many other creatives and working together. And uh, yeah. And then the end of that time came around. And the one thing, I, now my understanding is it's changed quite a bit. Okay. But at that time, art school was really studio based. Mm. And there was no what's next. It's okay. just now go out into the world and make art. Yeah. So there's no business training, no opportunity to figure out how, how do you actually be a professional artist? How do you approach galleries? How do you do mm -hmm. yeah. things from your own platform? Like none of that. So <laughs> uh, it was sort of, you know, what am I going to do next? Because I really didn't have the skills, I think, and I also didn't have the belief that it was possible to be a full-time professional artist just from the negative narrative of everything you've heard from everybody your whole life growing up. Yeah, yeah. Well, then I'm, I'm curious. I'm always curious about this part of the story because you are a, a full-time professional successful artist. So how, tell us about that journey, figuring all of that out on your own. <laughs> yeah, I and mean, it's really, you know, it kind of is that way, right? You know, as artists, we come together, it's collaboration over competition and work together to navigate it. So it is with the support of other artists that I found my way. But you do really have to get over things on your own. You have to get over the mental challenge of yeah. what it is and that it's a possible career and can be a vibrant and successful profession um, and that it's doable and that you can do it and learn the skills. And um, mm -hmm. so what happened for me is... I, you know, I do some university programs and studying and then maybe have like four months off, right? Just summertime and things like that from school. And so as soon as school stopped, instead of doing like, a, you know, a summer job, I would be like, okay, and now it's studio time. So art business, here we go. And so I would work with galleries and art centers and I would keep it kind of going. And then throughout the year, again, it would sort of be a side hustle. Yeah. 
Um, and, you know, I kind of fell off the, the tracks one point where I, uh, I did go in and became full time teaching full time. And I remember thinking to myself, I want to be an artist first, teacher second, not teacher first, artist second. Yeah. And it can be really difficult to, to navigate that because teaching full time is so all consuming. Yes. Um, that it's, it's really difficult to find the time and even the creative energy after giving so much all day, every day. Mm. Um, so I kind of, you know, I, for years was making art alongside my students, but I wasn't doing enough. I felt on mm. my own. So I was mm. always kind of brainstorming, like, how, how can I do, how can I do more on my own? How can I have this on my own? But I just didn't think it was possible to to make it happen yeah and just a limiting belief right yeah absolutely and uh anyhow so a whole bunch of stars collided and you know the galaxy <laughs> realigned for everyone in the world and i uh i just decided that i was going to take a sabbatical for my job mm -hmm. and have one year where i just went out there and saw what was possible wow give it a go and so in that year, I did a lot of, I did a lot of traveling too, but I did a lot of research and I just did mega learning, mega learning. So I was learning about marketing, about website building, about branding, about ads. Hmm. Um, never until like three and a half, four years ago, I had never had Facebook or Instagram. Oh, wow. <laughs> and uh, the only reason that I got Instagram is because I signed a contract with a gallery that had like a co-promotion in the yeah. contract. It's like, you have to have Instagram to work with us. And I'm yeah. like, oh no, now I have to learn how to do internet and so <laughs> Yeah. Um, but I did. And this is where I met more of my people and around the mm -hmm. world and have connected with so many under wonderful artists in such a supportive land of the internet. Yeah. And it's thanks to those platforms really that my business has grown so much and my confidence and that I've been able to get over that imposter syndrome of am I a professional artist? What does that look like? Mm -hmm. um, and so in that uh, time off, I eventually didn't go back to my job okay. and, and I resigned and my dream was really to have like a semi-nomadic business, an online mm -hmm. business, but I also wasn't sure how to make that possible because I had traditionally worked with physical galleries and had people come to my studio and studio tours. And um, so I really wanted to deep dive into self primarily self-representation. Okay. And moving a bit away from gallery representation yeah. and learning how to sell more from my platform so I could, you know, have the flexibility to move around. Mm -hmm. and, and that was a huge, deep journey. Yeah. And it happened that it was just like the year before this COVID business all happened oh, yeah. that I had kind of invested time in this. So when the whole COVID thing came and hit, I was kind of perfectly aligned where I'd already been doing this big investment mm -hmm. for getting myself set online, which was really quite nice. And I know a lot of people had a terrible difficulties for, during the past two years. Mm -hmm. um, and for me personally, they were actually the two most successful years of my business. Yeah. Uh, and I've heard that from some other artists as, as mm -hmm. well. Like, I'm like you're not a good Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So I guess what's ultimately happened now, again, please interrupt me anytime or I'm just going <laughs> to. <laughs> I think where I've landed is I consider myself now a hybrid artist. Um, so where I do have gallery representation, but I'm also self-represented as well. So I, I'm having the mix, mix of the two. So um, I am going to interrupt you here. I'm very curious how how you find that's going because I'm trying to do the same thing uh, to some degree. I'm not selling my work private, privately from my website or anything, but I do a lot of self-promotion and whatnot. And I'm in shows that aren't with my galleries, other online shows and whatnot. Um, so are you finding it tricky to do both? Is there conflict with your galleries, um, knowing that you're selling privately? Or? 
No, you mean like actual conflict of interest of who has which piece and things like that, like the, no. the nuts and bolts of the business or? No, no, no. More, yeah, more so, um, yeah, that competitive sort of piece. Or, I'm really not, I really haven't had any difficulties at all. And how I kind of do it is that I, for my personal work, not everybody works this way, I do. I release my working collections. So okay. it, depending, so I do annual planning. Generally, I release about four collections a year, okay. um, like a body of work that can be anywhere from 10 to 20 paintings. Nice. And I mean, that's just one sort of income source or part of the business, as everyone knows. And so I kind of have my own personal schedule that my audience and my collectors are kind of acclimatized to that, that rhythm. Mm -hmm. um, and then I do the work in between is what goes to my galleries. And I'm happy to like, you know, so I just, I know when I'm promoting for my collection launches and then I, in between, I'm promoting the works that are, are with my galleries. Okay. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but. Well, um, if, if your galleries haven't brought up that being a concern at all, then they must be okay with it. Yeah, they, I mean, yeah, I don't hide it that like I'm primarily self-represented. And of course, if somebody comes to me to buy uh, work from my website or from me personally, and they found me through the gallery, yep. um, I will give a commission to the gallery. Yep. Not 50%. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> maybe maybe around 20 or 25, depending if I had something pre-arranged, because they're still obviously my work was found through them. So that still serves a purpose. Okay. Interesting. Well, uh, good for you. And that I found seems to be kind of common. Um I think galleries know that people sell your work. And the one thing I think we can't say this enough, probably all of our artist communities, is that is just to be really consistent with your pricing, that you're mm -hmm. always having the same price for your work you privately that you do at the gallery. So you're never undercutting yourself or the gallery mm -hmm. and that your collectors also feel that yeah. fairness of value within the work. Yeah. All right. Now I want to bring you back to uh, the term imposter syndrome, because that is definitely <laughs> a theme we hear in every one of these interviews. Tell us <laughs> how you dealt with your imposter syndrome. Uh, yeah, the fake it, the fake it till you make it, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I know I, some of the um, clients and other like artists that I mentor, they say they don't feel like a real artist because they only have 300 followers on Instagram. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> However, you can't, you know, you can't let that d decide mm -hmm. um, if you're an artist or not. I, I think that the more you show up as a professional artist, Mm -hmm. the more natural it feels and the more natural it becomes. Mm -hmm. So how you speak to your collectors, how you speak to people in person at art shows, fairs, galleries, how, the narrative that you build and create on your Instagrams or your Facebook, the more you show up and you treat yourself like a professional artist, the easier it becomes to sort of get over that hurdle to believe that you really are. And, yeah. um, when you project yourself as being a professional artist, then other people accept you that way. It's mm -hmm. when you're unsure or wishy-washy, people are like, they'll question it too. Mm -hmm. So I think it's the standing the course, be strong, and you have to get comfortable with feeling uncomfortable. Yeah, isn't that the theme <laughs> of life? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, one thing that I, I love to mention is that uh, that fear the piece, um, you know, fear is something that many of us deal with, especially artists, we're putting our hearts out on our canvas right for the world to judge and, um, and that that's really courageous. And I, I remember when I used to struggle with fear, I mean, I still do. I thought it was because I didn't have courage. And then someone told me like, no, 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 no. It means you do have courage because you're going through your fear and you, you, it doesn't stop you, right? So um, yeah, it's very absolutely. Good. You have to make yourself, like what courage it takes to be so vulnerable, mm. to put your truest and deepest self out there for the public to Mm -hmm. see or judge or however you know whatever the big fears are in our mind and sometimes I like to think you know you may not think that you can get a lot done like in a week but you can get a lot done in a year 
Yeah. <laughs> sometimes if you even go through your, your day planner or your notebook or however you keep track of things, you just review your past year, you can make a little list of like wins. Like look at all the things you did that have contributed to your career as a professional artist. Even, even if it's just you made an application for a grant, who cares if you didn't get it? You made the application. That meant that you took yourself serious enough, mm -hmm. you put your name in the hat and you tried it on. Um, or for a residency, or you participated in a group show, or you were asked to do a talk or a podcast, or somebody else featured you on their website. I, when you make a little list of wins, sometimes you need to convince yourself and show yourself like, hey, I really am, mm -hmm. I really am doing this, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Thanks for that encouragement. I know that uh, we we love hearing that, um, and and we hear even from our masters like you and others that, that they're still dealing with imposter syndrome sometimes. All yeah. the time. Yeah, yeah. Constantly. I mean, I don't know if I, I don't think I'll ever arrive, right? Yeah. Or else I wouldn't be doing what what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Well, the next topic I kind of want to get into, there's a couple questions I will, I'll get to first, but uh, just so you can start thinking. I, I love um, abstract art. I love what you do. I don't do abstract, but it fascinates me um, because I can pick up what, you know, the feeling, the energy that you're putting out there. Um, and, and it's not necessarily that I'm seeing like, obviously like a landscape or anything, but um, I'm always wondering if, for our, our abstract artists, what that process is like, what is it that you need to get out of your system and how do you do that in an abstracted sort of way? What's that process like? But before you answer it, there's a couple questions. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> um, how do you know where people find you from uh, and whether it's from a gallery or directly from your website? Do you just grill them? Uh, <laughs> just grill them. Yeah, so generally I will ask, uh, also, if I have something that people are going to put in a shop, like in the cart, right from my website, I actually do ask um, okay. where they found me. If somebody contacts me for a commission in my commission intake form, I ask. Uh, mm -hmm. So I do, I do just make it sort of casual and I ask. Because the other thing is, it's important information for me, right? I keep a little secret spreadsheet on all my collectors. Yeah, good. <laughs> um, just so I can always track over the years who's bought what and where, and who's bought repeat and when, yeah. and how they found me. Because that's great business insight for me too, to see mm -hmm. where my marketing efforts are working and what's valuable and what's not. So a lot of people are coming through this gallery or a lot of people are coming through this platform. So I do, I do ask because um, I want to see what energy and efforts and where I'm putting my money yeah. um, is, is worth it. So yeah, I just ask. And anytime I can get a form on something to get okay. people to just click <laughs> something. Uh, another question, who sets the pricing for gallery pieces? Sorry, say that again? Who sets the pricing for your gallery pieces? Me. Okay. Mm -hmm. Always yeah. me. Mm -hmm. And um, if, it, if a gallery is not comfortable with my pricing, then they're not the right fit for me. Yeah, awesome. Okay. Yeah. All right, let's dive into this abstract. Um, okay. And I also get into like being authentically um, the artist that you want to be while balancing that with what your what sells, because obviously what you just said about keeping track of what you know yeah. collectors are buying, do you adjust? Um, how do you balance authenticity with that? Yeah, so I know there's a lot of people, I'll start backwards. I know there's a lot of people who find what sells and they make more of that. Right. They don't do that. Okay. I can't do that. Okay. <laughs> it doesn't work for me. Okay. So, um, you know, when I come up with a new body of work or collection that might be quite diverse from my last one, I might lose um, some people who were, you know, on the journey with me, mm -hmm. but I'll gain new people who will come along so I try not to worry about that. So I need to really, I always just maintain passion for what's working for me and what I'm feeling to create. But in terms of the abstract, um, when I was younger and I was in art school and then high school, I, I created abstract work. I was, I was really a, 
into just like intuitive painting and sensation and um, texture and color and sort of like, you know, I, I kind of have a, I'll live in a little bit of a word of synesthesia and seeing things in color and having colors for how I, you know, uh, identify with like the days of the week and things like that. So oh, interesting. Um, so th it's always been something that's been a, a part of my life. And then, you know, I hit some point where I thought, this is not enough. People aren't going to connect with this. There's not enough information. There's not enough narrative. Mm -hmm. And then I started working with um, old photographs and portraits and like combining them with my abstracts and making them more into to backgrounds. Okay. Um, and it was fun, but it still didn't really feel like me. Hmm. And so I kind of went through maybe a two or three year process of like figuring out what my work is, why do I create it, who am I as an artist, what is it I really want to put out there, not what sells, not what other people want, not what I see online, but hmm. like what is in me. Yeah. And how I feel, which there's probably a lot of people that feel this way, is I feel that my work, my paintings themselves are, um, they're translations of the memories. Hmm. So sensations and feelings, stories, my own or others. So it's a, you know, focusing in on a sensation or a feeling or a memory from childhood or something like that, and making a translation of that into shapes and colors. Okay. Um, and so as I see it, I have sort of a um, <laughs> lexicon, as you could say, uh, or an artistic vocabulary with some mm -hmm. symbols perhaps that repeat themselves in my work. Okay. And I think that's where the authentic um, style or the personal artistic style comes from. And, you know, it's really about evoking that emotive sensation of like, I recently had a commission and I uh, was somebody who I knew from my childhood. Oh, nice. And, <laughs> yeah. Awesome. And I have this like really particular memory of us catching frogs in the creek with, oh. you know, with nets together as children and up at the cottage. And, and I just couldn't let that go. So eventually that's what came out. And, uh, you know, I look at, and then when it was over and I was finished and I look at the colors and the shapes and I thought for me, that's really what it was. It was just like encapsulating this experience of us together as mm -hmm. children and playing in summer days. And um, and I only sent her the title, nothing else. And when she got it, she said she completely felt that. Oh, wow. <laughs> that never happened. Uh, and so I, yeah, I think about it as trans, uh, the abstraction is translation of, of memories and emotions mm -hmm. and you know, in a different a different form. That's awesome uh, comment from Anne. Love that translation of a memory. So inspiring. Uh, yeah, that's great. And and what a full circle experience for you to be able to paint for someone from your childhood. Wow. It it's been yeah it's been quite incredible too. Uh, I feel so honored to get to do that. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I used to be so afraid of commissions. Um, and because, you know, sometimes it's people who you really, it's like people you don't know or people you do know either way. You're like, will I please them? Will they like it? Is it what they want? And I just, I would feel itchy <laughs> thinking about completing the commission. Mm -hmm. And I've had this polar switch now. It's all I want to do. It's my absolute favorite. I realized that you can just like, you get to co-create with somebody and work with them yeah. and you know, share that energy and then put it into the work. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love it. So now like, give me, let's do the commissions. Let's do that <laughs> one. Because it's such yeah. a great feeling to be creating a bespoke custom piece mm -hmm. for somebody who is truly passionate about your work and your vision yeah. and your story and how you create. They just perhaps maybe don't have the personal tools for the visual translation. Mm -hmm. So they're working with you to cultivate that. And that's really quite beautiful. It is. I, I love doing commissions too. And used to find them very stressful. I think most artists probably go through that journey. Um, and one thing that I love about it, and in addition to what you said, well, I love that collaborating and, and taking, um, <clears throat> you know, getting out of someone else's head 
and putting it onto a canvas and, and hitting the mark, right? And then another piece that I love is taking those ideas and creating new work with it because I learned something new. They, their ideas were not my ideas, but I can still run with it. It's very exciting. Absolutely. I just, I just have a quick question there. Somebody asked about, do I charge more for commissions? Mm. Um, I personally do. Uh, I charge 20% more for commission work, mm -hmm. um, which I feel offers quite great value because I do one-on-one -on -one video chat meetings ahead of time for like an hour. Um, I do vision and mood boards. I have them send me inspiration work. I do sort of mock-ups of not of paintings or drawings, but just mood and vision boards. Yeah. And we work, I really try and include uh, the collector in the process. So it does feel co-created. So I do have a 20% uh, increase on that. Mm -hmm. um, however, I have worked with quite a few other professional artists and different artist groups. And many of my colleagues don't do that. Um, they might do something different where somebody hires them for a commission and they make two uh, at the same time. And yeah. then they let the collector choose their favorite and then the other one they send to the gallery or sell, sell themselves. Yeah. So different people have different ways, but maybe they don't put as much time and investment into nurturing the process as I do. Mm -hmm. But for me, I really enjoy working with people and that's just part of my process. So I do charge. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I think that's, I think that's uh, fantastic. I, uh, this painting right there is um, inspiration for this one. That's the commission that I have a client for, but I took the ideas and thought, well, let me just try it smaller in a different shape and see how it feels. And anyways, um, yeah, well, that's cool. I, I don't charge extra, but I, I have been wanting to because I'm, I'm spending more and more time on the front end. Um, yeah, yes. and I mean, one thing that we're not so great at in being professional artists, again, the imposter syndrome and not considering us valuable enough to be paid for our time. And, yeah. um, you know, we, we don't think that we deserve to be paid for that time. And okay. we do, and you are. Mm, yeah, amen to that. <laughs> So how about um, planting seeds for the future is something that you put in your, um, what you sent me this morning. I'd be okay. curious to, to chase that. I love, I love that whole concept. Yeah. I think, you know, building your own professional art business, it's a, it's a slow journey, but it's an exciting journey. Mm -hmm. And each year you more customize that you're increasing your income and doing more of what you want. Okay. So I, you know, I find that uh, one of the things I said recently in an interview, which now I'm embarrassed about, was I said it's sometimes like throwing spaghetti at the wall <laughs> and <laughs> what sticks. Thanks. But I mean, I think that it's important as artists that in our business that we find sustainability. Mm -hmm. There's some people who can paint 300, 400 paintings a year. I mean, like that's incredible. Yeah. I can't do that. No. So simply painting alone is not sustainable enough for me to run a business. And so, you know, having diversified income streams and putting myself into different pockets in different places is what, you know, brings together business. And so when I talk about planting seeds, um, I apply for big, huge things that are way over my head. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, I just, so, you know, and I mean, I don't get a lot of them, right? But um, when I see these things for like huge hospital installations or like stuff for the Arts and Culture Foundation, or I don't know, things that come across my across my email, mm -hmm. I'm throwing my name in the hat. If I think it actually, I'm not gonna apply for things that don't suit me. Yeah. Uh, but I put my name in the hat for artist residencies, for different shows, for things that are like big, big lofty goals, mm -hmm. then I have kind of like a mid range, yeah, maybe this is acceptable. And then I go for a few low hanging fruit. Nice. And just planting seeds for what comes up because then I find a lot of these things take six months, one year, a year and a half. Some of these big grants and things take two years to come to fruition. Wow. I don't know who I am or where I'm gonna be in two years time. Yeah. Um, and what's really nice is that the future comes and it's really nice to have more doors to open than not. Mm -hmm. You can always say, say no, but you're never going to be 
considered or have these opportunities unless you apply. Mm. And so I really think it's important to take time in your studio practice if it's Mondays or half day on Friday or whatever it is for your own, say, business investment or professional development where you're planting seeds mm-hmm. of how you're going to grow business. Because just keep doing the same thing over and over again isn't growing. So thinking about how you're going to grow. And mm-hmm. often when I work with mentoring artists, we do annual planning as well. And we talk about how we're going to, you know, increase sales for next year. Um, but that doesn't mean painting more, making more. It's trying to mm. <laughs> work, work smarter. And so, um, yeah, I just, that's one thing I'd love to encourage people to do is, uh, yeah, you, you'll never be considered unless you put your name in to be considered. And mm. I know it's hard sometimes to think that, you know, you think, how will I ever get into this? But you don't know unless you unless you try. Yeah. So you just gotta keep putting your name in the hat. <laughs> yeah. I love that idea of having an annual plan. I, I have not obviously done that. Um, <laughs> uh, it's a good idea. Yeah, how to be, uh, not paint more, but um, be smarter and, and build the business side and make more money, not, not just getting busier and busier and busier. Because you can't, you can't, make, you can't paint more. You can't make more hours. And, uh, you know, as business owners and artists, I, I don't know how many hours people work, but in, in 2020, I think I was like, you know, working like 80 hours a week or something like that. That's silly. <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> no. no, you can't paint out of, uh, I think you might start resenting uh, the craft if you're exhausting yourself. Yeah. And, you know, at the time I was pregnant um, mm. with my first, and I was just like so concerned about like, losing my business and having it fall off the rails once baby came that Mm -hmm. I was just trying to like work ahead work ahead and try and get all these things on autopilot and having different passive income streams and it was like way too much yeah way too much Mm -hmm. Um, so sustainability I think is is important and just finding things that you enjoy so balancing what you enjoy and what makes you money and it's your each year you're tweaking and playing with that Mm -hmm. yeah I like that comment from Nikki I love the idea of an annual plan as well I haven't heard that from artists before but makes so much sense thank you yeah absolutely and I think something I had I'll just touch on but you know some years ago I was really always intimidated by the business aspect of being a professional artist and I just thought, oh, I don't have these skills. I don't have this knowledge. I don't have this training. Uh, I know nothing about this. And, you know, it turns out you can learn. Yeah. <laughs> all your life experience and all your jobs and everything you've done can contribute to that. Mm-hmm. And now it's kind of one of my passions to share with emerging artists and aspiring artists is how to, um, I, I make the assumption, maybe I shouldn't, but I make the assumption that you're all creative and you all know how to create work. Okay. And we can help support each other to create stronger and more, you know, and better work. But where we really need the support is how do we put the art out in the world? How do we sell it? How do we attract new collectors? How do we approach galleries? How do we develop our branding? What kind of marketing is useful? And um, so this is the stuff that I love helping artists with now, making annual plans, making holiday sales plans, how to release a collection from start to finish over the course of three months, how to develop email lists and how to grow that. And um, because people just think we just hang out and paint in our studios all day. (laughs) Sometimes there's no time. (laughs) Yeah, that's fantastic. You're very intentional. I appreciate that. Uh, And I know that for those of you, again, who uh, are are not familiar with Masterius, Shannon is one of our mentors and your mentorship group will have a maximum of eight emerging artists, if I remember correctly, and it starts in October. And are you focusing on the business side? Yeah, so I wanted to be, uh, I obviously like with all master's groups, open to the desires and the needs of the people in mm-hmm. the group. So I think that, um, I don't want to say that it's only focusing on developing the business because part of developing your business is artists supporting each other to create our best work. Right. Mm -hmm. And so giving each other feedback and helping each other on creating our best work is still really 
really important. Mm -hmm. But that is something that I would love to uh, work with the group is about how to develop a sustainable business. Um, And how do we create, yeah, how do we create connection with new collectors and find new collectors and bring them on? And how do you cultivate diversified income streams to make a business as a whole? Mm -hmm. Um, And whatever that looks like for you, is it prints, is it teaching? Is it art licensing? Is it curating? Is it, you know, being a juror, sitting on panels, um, all the different ways that you can uh, bring a business together? Yeah, I am. Um, uh, and also, folks, I'm going to stay on after the event to chat about masters to give questions. And I'm going to give away one month events membership too. I always forget to remind people of that. But Shannon, can you tell us some of your favorite um, alternate income streams that are maybe passive? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one thing that I, I'm not doing right now, which I do think is such a wonderful thing for artists, is, is making prints. Mm-hmm. Um, now, there's different ways people can make prints, different platforms and websites. Um, some people work directly with a local printer and they keep a stock Some people work with something online and they do drop shipping where things are made to order. What I myself have done is I actually, I don't know how I got so lucky. My partner found this opportunity like four years ago um, as a part of a startup, which is now a huge flourishing business. I work with a gallery in Berlin that wanted to make art accessible and affordable. Mm -hmm. And so they originally started by only having prints that were all under uh, 100 euros. Oh, wow. And I was in their first roster of their first 10 artists. <laughs> and now it's huge. Wow. Um, it's called Kunst 100. If anyone wants to ch- check it out. Uh, but anyhow, there's other great platforms like that where you can work with an online gallery. They also have pop-up shows all around Europe. Mm-hmm. They are also working with originals now. Um, recently, my work was selected for a local partnership in Berlin, which I don't think we have this in Canada. Um, do we have H&M Home in Canada? Uh, no, right? no, not, not home. Okay, so my understanding is it's like anthropology for the home. Okay. And I guess, you know, H&M is trying to develop their brand to have more sustainability and more local and trying to connect more. And so they wanted to have art from people Mm-hmm. Uh, living in Europe and living local, working with local galleries. Um, and so the like main one in Berlin actually has an entire gallery wall now that's in conjunction. Like thing with this print gallery I work with. So these are like opportunities I never could have imagined mm. that would have, um, you know, would have come my way. But it all started with just making a quick application and putting my name in the hat. What, what was the name of the company again? Called Kunst, K U N S T, 100. Um, and Kunst means art in German for all our, for people who don't speak German. Um, so my, my partner is German, and so we spend quite some time in, in Germany. Okay. Um, so it's quite nice to be able to go there and visit. But as their business is growing, um, I've been so fortunate to grow alongside with them. And I've also developed uh, quite some relationships with different. Uh, designers who have also styled my work in some of their featured spaces, which has led to um, additional work as well. So these are more of the planting the seeds things. So yeah, print is a great thing. Um, There's a platform that, uh, I don't know if people have heard of Minted before. It's an American platform. Okay. I think it's traded on the market to value that's been like 2 billion. Oh, really? (laughs) huge uh, platform and they in the last five years have a professional fine artists chapter where they do design challenges and calls okay. and um, you can sell prints through them okay but of course the artwork still remains your own and your own um, intellectual property creative property but they also have an option where um, people can actually hire and commission you for work through minted as well um, I myself am just sort of exploring it, but a lot of my um, colleagues work on there, 
And in one of my professional artist groups I'm in, just to give people some numbers here, uh, one of the girls in the group is uh, $90,000 US a year of her income is coming from minted prints. Wow. <laughs> Another girl, it's 60,000. And then the people who are sort of at the lower level are doing between five and 10. So depending on how much energy and effort you want to put into it. Anyhow, I think that how it works is you have to get into these design challenges and get your work accepted and maybe it's gotta be a good fit. But things like that, um, you mm -hmm. know, two times a year, you put in the energy and effort again, put your name in the hat, submit your application. Um, and if your design selected, uh, then you're in. And then they also pot they partner with uh, Pottery Barn in West Elm and different things like that. So again, yeah. every time your work goes somewhere, it's getting in front of a new audience, new eyes, new people, yeah. new potential collectors. Yeah. Um, so I think some of these like print platforms are super low risk mm -hmm. with the potential for quite some, quite some reward. Yeah, thank you for that. I put the uh, links in the chat folks for thank Minted you. and Kunst 100. Uh, fantastic. I am also going to look into them. Uh, thank you for sharing that. That's that's great. I, I always think more yeah, locally, absolutely. but yeah, uh, I guess yeah. why not abroad? And there's like Artfully Walls is quite popular with Canadians. Do you know Artfully that one? Walls. Yeah, that one I've heard of. Yeah. Um, yeah. I have a whole list of, of different ones, but obviously there's some that have bigger rewards and you have to decide what's worth it to you or not like one of the artists that i've been mentoring for some years she's a surface pattern designer mm. um so she doesn't mind uh like licensing her work or giving up the rights to some of her images and stuff because that's you know what what works with her yeah um i've worked with some designers for doing like garment prints with pattern repeat and things like that oh, okay where it's um i still get to re retain the licensing on on that mm -hmm. sometimes a percentage sometimes it's on a one-time fee and again things i never my like never could have thought of mm -hmm. but just one day an email from somebody um who makes custom women's golf clothing in california really? and liked my work oh cool like i don't know how this stuff comes about but <laughs> work out there, the more eyes it's in front of and mm. the more interesting opportunities that will present themselves yeah, that's really exciting. Yeah, uh, and a great encouragement. Just put yourself out there and see uh, see what sticks. Um, Suzanne is wondering, do you need to copyright your work? I mean, in Canada, we it's automatic. Um, and and in Finland, are you are you technically Canadian working in Finland or are you? So right now, I'm Canadian citizen, Finland resident. Copyright is a deep deep dark woods um, and it depends on what you're doing and what's happening and so um, one thing is that I never work without a contract for anything okay. even a simple commission I think everything should have a contract and mm -hmm. um, you're getting into something uh, where copyright's a concern it's I, I don't hesitate at all to hire a lawyer pay them 100 200 bucks just to quickly look stuff over yeah. um to help me navigate that because that money is nothing compared to what could happen if somebody else can start selling selling your design so um bringing in other professionals who know more about it is often what i do if i'm if i'm unsure um i've never gone through the process of having to formally register and copyright my work because as you say we are protected in canada but um i have had lawyers like look over contracts and things like that for me okay yeah, me too. Yeah. Cool. Um, all right. So how about um, advice that you would give to emerging artists? Well, one thing I think like platforms and groups such as Mastrius um, and collaborating with other artists, having opportunities for mentorship is just so invaluable. Mm -hmm. And even though I'm on here now and I'm offering mentorship on your platform as a master artist, I myself still have mentors that I work with as well and there's always something you can learn more about mm -hmm. however you don't need to learn it all 
the same time. So I think it's important to just pick one thing that you're interested in and you think you can succeed at and deep dive in that for a while, see how it is, mm-hmm. and then move on to the next thing. Not trying to learn all the things at the same time. Yeah. But working with mentorship groups is fantastic because it gives you the opportunity One, to work with a mentor, but also to work with other group members that are professional artists. Mm -hmm. You can ask your burning 3 a.m. questions about like, how do you make cardboard corners to ship something in this type of package? (laughs) Um, Things you'd be otherwise embarrassed to ask, but Mm -hmm. it's really like important stuff. Like how do you carefully package your work? Um, And then right down to, yeah, Everybody has different ideas and different ways that they put their work out in the world. And it's really nice to share that. It's also really nice to have feedback um, from your peers and from a mentor so that you can really truly be trying to focus on creating your best, most authentic work. Mm -hmm. Because we have a deep personal connection and attachment to all of our work. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if anyone else has gone through this, but I had years where like I couldn't sell my paintings. Oh yeah, <laughs> and I was just like too connected, and I was afraid to release them into the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you know, it's really nice to have objective and subjective eyes who can look at the work and give you honest and kind feedback. Yeah, not a critique, not tearing you down, yeah. but giving you the honest feedback to help you steer yourself in creating your best work sometimes we can't see it we're too close Mm, yeah that's very very so yeah taking it slow and working with mentors and mentorship groups and connecting with artists to remember that we're not artists working alone in our little silos studios anymore we need to collaborate and lift each other up and support each other towards success it is not competition. It is always collaboration over competition. And there's nothing to even compete over. Mm-hmm. Um, let's share all of our hot tips and what's working. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's awesome. Yeah, you're speaking my love language. That is definitely <laughs> <laughs> what we're what we're trying to build a mastery is, is that very uh, environment and community where we're yeah. we're working hard to actually lift each other up. And and man, do we go further faster yeah. we're working together collaborating yeah it's fantastic yeah and I mean when you're working in these groups it's they're always more transformational than you ever could have imagined you think mm-hmm. oh I'm maybe gonna learn some new techniques and some demos or a little bit of this but then when you you know you show up for the meetings and it's like <laughs> you want you're just taking notes and <laughs> want to like retain it all because yeah. there it's all it's all juicy <laughs> Yeah, that's right. And, and, and life giving. And um, I think what's interesting is you don't know what you don't know. Um, and there are these big gaps in our knowledge and experience that we can be completely unaware of. Uh, and so we can be bumping up against obstacles that we don't even know are there really until we bring more people in to, to take a look. Oh, I 100% agree. You know, when I, uh, when I first moved to Finland, I was like, okay, so here we are. Now I'm back to full-time studio work again in another country where I don't speak the language and I have, I'm in a small town and I have no connections. Wow. And I was really stumped up about shipping my work because mm-hmm. a lot of my collectors are in Canada and the US. And I was just stumped. Like I couldn't figure out these details of shipping, shipping the work. I can't even tell you like how, how many friends I've made online. Oh. Yep. I just like cold calling people on Instagram, Finns, and be like, how do we do this? Uh, mm-hmm. And now I look back and I think, why was that such a barrier? Why was I creating so many barriers for myself? Mm-hmm. Thinking, oh, I can't launch my website or I can't start this course or I can't do that because I don't know how to do shipping. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. My mentor at Masters, I just had my session with her yesterday and was something she said, that speaks to this ready is when you start yeah absolutely I fully agree with that yeah you it's like with everything like with the prints and stuff people say they're not ready it's like get something out there now it doesn't mm-hmm. matter you look back and say that's not my best work and you take it down and you put something new in 
but you mm. just need to start. Nice. Awesome. Yeah. Love it. yeah. A comment from Caitlin, even uh, just in this hour, I have three pages of notes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I know you're going to be fantastic. Uh, mentor. <laughs> yeah, uh, you, you have so many, you have such great business sense. Um, you're very creative on the business side. It's awesome. Yeah, I'm inspired. You. Which is as a result of me being a part of um, other mentorship circles and groups that mm. over the years, I mean, obviously we all have our own ideas, but what I've learned from working with other professionals uh, that I just never thought was possible. I, I currently, I'm mentoring somebody right now that I'm learning so much from. She, um, she lives in LA and she rents her ceramic sculptures out to the studios. Oh. And they're in like all these movies and shows and things like that. Oh, cool. and I'm, <laughs> I never really thought about that, but like, what about people living in like Vancouver or something like that? Yeah. That could be yeah. probably possible or Toronto or something. Anyway, or even you could ship it too, but what a cool thing. Yeah. There's lots yeah. of ideas out there. I have a friend too that rents her work out for movie sets and whatnot. And then she sees it on the big screen and um, like, I didn't even realize that that was a thing. Amazing. Yeah, I have another friend who has like an ongoing contract with one of my favorite channels, HGTV. <laughs> oh. And, um, you know, like working with these like property brothers or love it or list it or all these different things and getting in with those um, designers and having her work in the shows, which uh, for people who end up joining my group, working with designers, I think is a mm -hmm. really interesting um, business opportunity as being quite good to me and it's a it's kind of a long journey but it's a really interesting thing to explore yeah for sure um more comments great information and well presented thank you very much from so thank you for being here and from leanne this is very helpful thank you i love the support and encouragement in this community yeah leanne. Absolutely. i do too that's awesome all right we have two minutes um oh. last thing you want to leave us with um, what might that be? <laughs> no pressure. Yeah, I, I just, um, if I could just like wrap my arms around everybody and hug them tight mm -hmm. just to give them, as you say, the courage or the vulnerability to put themselves out there, you know, mm -hmm. and not waiting, as you say, until you're, until you're ready. Just yeah. make the application, post it online, um, whatever it is, but just start putting yourself out there now. And, and maybe it's not ready, maybe it's not the best, but then you exist and you grow on that. And the great thing about that is people don't buy art just for how the art looks. Mm -hmm. They want to be a part of your journey, your narrative and your story. So when you start putting stuff out, they get to travel with you, right? They get to be a part of that story of where you are now and where you go. And that's, that's really quite cool. Just yeah. Put yourself out there now because you can. Absolutely. Absolutely. Be courageous. We've got your back. And you're totally right. Collectors collect the artists, not really the artwork. Yeah. Yeah. They're more interested in you. Wonderful. And so just be vulnerable enough to let people in on mm -hmm. as much as you're comfortable with. Yeah. yeah. And a comment from Anna. Oh my gosh, Shannon, that is so sweet and so amazing. I think she's responding yeah. to the hug. And from Nikki, thank you. This has been an amazing talk. Yeah, thank you, Shannon. Um, yeah, absolutely. I just love this. I never quite know where it's going to go. And it's so, <laughs> it's always so unique and helpful and life giving. Thank you for sharing yeah. so openly. Appreciate uh, it. Of course. Uh, I'm so happy to be here and have this chat. And uh, I'm really looking forward to our new group that's going to start in October. And yeah. uh, yeah, if this sort of these topics and this content speak to you, then maybe it could be something that's a good fit for you, and we can deep, deep, deep dive <laughs> further awesome. into all of it. That's perfect. I'm going to share your page. Uh, so again, folks, stick around if you are curious about how to work with Shannon at Masterius or just curious about our community. There's other ways to join the community too. And I'll give away one month events membership. All right, Shannon. Thank you. Round of applause, everyone. <laughs> Lots of thank thanks. you, everybody. Thank you.
really um yeah. that flew by so it did it did <laughs> all right have a wonderful week and thanks again shannon well, you too bye everyone take care bye.